from Hollywood, it's the Tom Likas Show. Oh, God. And now, and now, here he is, Tom Likas. Thank you for tuning in to the Tom Likas Show. This is where America gets together to talk about the issues you really care about. It's a different kind of a radio talk real quick. We're the radio talk show that is not hosted by a right-wing wacko or a convicted felon. No! I am your host. Write down our toll-free telephone number. You're going to need it. It's 1-800-5800-TOP. 1-800-5800-866. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for being part of our program. Here we are together again on the radio. And here we are, Thanksgiving week, for God's sake. Wow. Thanksgiving week. Jesus. Freaking me out. The year has gone so fast. What are you going to do? It's always another year to burn off coming soon. That's what we're going to do. Many of you know that um, that I have been uh, doing a Thanksgiving event for many, many years. Many, many. And uh, it all began back in the early days of my... I'm going to say the early days of my radio career because I've been doing this since I was 14. I guess the early days of the part of my career where I left home it was back when I was in Stanton, Virginia, that I had my first Orphan Thanksgiving. And the purpose of Orphan Thanksgiving was this. It originally started where I worked at this radio station, WTON in Stanton, Virginia, Dean, I'm sure you've already looked it up every year I've ever mentioned WTON. and WTON now, the uh, AM 1240 is now ESPN Radio in Stanton, Virginia. But back then, and uh, I keep promising this, but uh, I am going to deliver. I, I have air checks of WTON way back when I was <laughs> puking my way to the top. And um, it was one of the miserable jobs in my life from a radio perspective. I mean, if you think of this as an art form or you think of this as a craft, you think of this as uh, a dream job, working at WTON in Stanton, Virginia was anything but a dream I honestly believe it was a step above working at, uh, like, Walmart. WTON paid me $160 a week. And for $160 a week, I was expected to show up <laughs> for 60 hours every week. Six zero. And... Uh, the hours kind of worked like this. I had only one day off, and it was Mondays. Monday was my day off. I worked every other day. Every, not, You know what I mean. I worked Tuesday through Sunday. My hours, I had an air shift from 5.30 p.m. until midnight. You heard right, six and a half hours at the board. The last hour I was not actually speaking very much except for saying the name of the station and the weather forecast, the overnight weather forecast, because the last half hour, if you can imagine this, was religious programming. 
you know, that kind of paid religious programming where somebody pays the station for us to run a half hour of religion. And the um, half hour between 11 and 11.30 was every AM radio network feature that we had taped during the day and had not played in its regular time slot. It was features like Paul Harvey's The Rest of the Story and Lou Boda Sports. Is Lou Boda still alive? Who knows? And um, Gordon Williams, who at the time was the editor of Money Magazine, he did a uh, business update. Gordon Williams' business update ran at 11.25 p.m. Now, think about this. On the East Coast, the New York Stock Exchange closes at 4.30 p.m. Why in the world would you run the Gordon Williams Business Report almost seven hours later at 11.25 p.m.? I'm going to tell you why. Because the general manager of the station who, by the way, could never get over the fact that he wasn't on the air anymore. His name was uh, Al Schmick. But Al uh, continued to call himself by his air name, Al Charles. Um, 11 was about the Betty by time for Al. And he wanted to go to bed with WTON on and find out how Wall Street did that day. And so... The pressure was on because Al, well, let's just say he was a combustible personality and used to yell at me all the time for, you name it, used to yell at me. First of all, in the state of Virginia, and I had just arrived, there are very few cities or towns that are pronounced the way they're spelled. And invariably, I would mispronounce the name of a city or a town name. And Al sat in his office, and it was amazing. He had his office set up. So although it was not directly ahead of me, it was like in direct line of sight. I would look out the corner of my eye, and I could see him daily dressed in a white shirt, a blindingly white shirt, I could see him sitting at his desk, and it was almost as if he planned it this way, and I wouldn't be surprised if he did. A reminder that the general manager was always watching you. And this is one of these radio stations that had a rotary dial phone with one of those locks that you stick in the number one so you can't dial an outgoing call. I mean, you couldn't dial 911 if there were an emergency, okay? Because Al had the phone locked. Also, Al had a buzzer, much like a game show buzzer that used to ring in the studio as his intercom buzzer. And the buzzer didn't mute. Everybody in the radio business knows what I'm talking about. You know, no matter what noises are in the studio, when you press a microphone button, it shuts off the sound of all of the equipment that might make a noise little beeps and boops, uh, they're all shut down by the mute button, the muting capability uh, of the on-off switch of the mic. Um, but, of course, you'd probably have to pay the chief engineer for a half an hour of his time to come in and do that. So Al's intercom button did not mute when you turn the microphone on. And on top of that, Al had such a temper, he couldn't be bothered to wait until you get into the next set. You know, like you'd finish the stop set, which is the break with all the commercials and all the weather forecast and what have you. Then you would play a jingle, and then you would play the next song. And Al, I mean, for Christ's sake, the guy had an air name, and he's the general manager, Al Charles. Al used to... Uh, <laughs> Al used to sit in the other room, and if I would mispronounce a town name, I would be in the middle of reading a live commercial and you'd hear, ah! Ah! and I would have to pick up the phone. What I would do is I'd pick it up, put it down, and finish 
reading the commercial for Transit Mix Concrete Corporation or any other fine sponsors we had back then. And um, so sure enough, you know, Al would be burning mad because he had to wait for you to talk to it. I can't get... I'm on the air. I've got the mic open. I can't get... It's, it's pronounced Norfolk, not Norfolk. It's not Norfolk. Scream at the top of his lungs into the telephone and be so pissed because I had to finish reading his buck a clock commercial that I was trying to read there. So, uh, Al would go to Betty by about 11 o'clock and he would be in bed waiting to hear the Gordon Williams business report. Now, of course, the rest of Stanton, Virginia may have wanted to hear this report when the stock market closed. Get an idea of how their mutual funds and stocks did and stuff. But Al's need to hear it when he was under the covers wearing his jammies was far more important than you, the listener, needing the information when you need it. Okay, I'm a, I'm a stock market investor. I can't imagine the stock market report not coming on until 1125. And by the way, don't say, well, you could just tune to the other station. There were six stations in town, and most of them played just music with no news or information. We were all of that. We were the news and information source for the illiterates who lived in this particular town. God forbid they pick up a newspaper and actually read it. So anyway, during my shift in the afternoon when I came on at 5.30, uh, in addition to being a disc jockey and having to play jingles and pick songs to play and uh, set up my breaks with all my commercials, all my little 10-second billboards, telling you to tune in tomorrow morning to hear the death notices brought to you by a certain local mortuary, and I'm not kidding. That was... One of the billboards I used to have to read. In addition to doing all of that, there were six large reel-to-reel -reel tape decks onto which I was to tape the features that we would play back at other times. Now, what are features? You know, we were, because there were only six stations in town, and only our station did news and, and information, we were affiliated with more than one network. We were affiliated with the ABC Entertainment Network the ABC Information Network, the Mutual Broadcasting System, now defunct. And we used to play features from all of them. And features are things, if you've ever heard on the radio, like the Osgood file. It's like a three, four, five-minute segment with a commercial or two contained within the feature. And they're meant primarily for news radio stations. And... Um, because we were a music station that had news, well, we couldn't frequently, like, like, for example, they'd send one of these features down at 4.25 p.m. If you're in the middle of a song, you can't stop down to play the sports report. So what you would do is you would have to record the feature on one of the tape machines behind me. And that's the other thing. They were behind me, not in front of me. In front of me, it was nothing but glass. All of the tape recorders were behind me, so... When you pressed the record button, you didn't know if the tape had broken or if somebody forgot to thread the tape or if there was no tape in the machine or maybe you didn't press the button hard enough and, and the, the machine didn't start playing. For whatever reason, and I do believe it's because the timing of the feature came right in the middle of a break where I would be reading live commercials and and talking on the air, the one feature I forgot to record more often than not was Gordon Williams' business report. Gordon Williams. And of course, 1125 would come along and I'd be playing a song to fill the five minutes where Gordon's mellifluous tones would have been heard, followed by a half hour of religious broadcasting, followed by our national anthem, and then we would sign off until 5 a.m. Back when radio stations did that. TV and radio stations. Kids, the stations used to sign off about midnight or 1 o'clock. They used to play the national anthem. And then they would come back on the air in the morning sometime. In our case, it was 5 a.m. Had to get up with the farmers. 
Why pay an overnight guy? Nobody's listening anyway. So 1125 would come along and suddenly you'd hear, you know, Lionel Richie instead of Gordon Williams. Or you would hear Tommy Two-Tone instead of Gordon Williams or whatever. And, of course, the telephone with that that filthy green telephone. Remember those old AT&T telephones? Those big bells in them. They were like fire alarm bells inside. Hardwired. And had that big lock. And all the, the grimy holes two through zero where people tried to stick their finger in the hole and tried to dial out with the lock on it. It never worked. That phone would ring. And it would be Al Charles. Where's Gordon Williams? God damn it, I turn on the radio. I expect to hear Gordon Williams. What do I pay you for? You're paying me $160 a week, Al. <laughs> um, and was it really worth this abuse? Well, I, I did have to give that some serious thought. And, by the way, of course, the anger was cumulative every time I forgot to record Gordon Williams and the phone rang again. And so what I ultimately had to do was I had to... I had to practice this. I used to run down the hall, because I knew at 5.55 p.m. or whatever time that, that report aired on the network, I knew that I had forgotten to record it. So now I had five and a half hours to fix this problem. And I couldn't exactly call the ABC network and ask them to refeed the Gordon Williams business report. So I would run down the hall to the AP wire machine, you know, the teletype machine. We have the sound of a teletype machine, kids, before computers and laser printers. Uh, this is what it used to sound like at the radio station down in the newsroom, like that. And these... Teletype machines would be printing out the news. Very. Slowly. And so I would go down the hall while a record was playing. And try, back when we called them records. And I used to have to grab the business report. Of course, because I had no time to be watching the teletype machine... There were 37 miles of paper that had come out over the course of the last six hours. Weather forecasts, farm reports, the headlines for 5 o'clock, 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.30, 7 o'clock. And I had to dig through all that and find the business report. And then, while I'd be sitting there by myself late at night, waiting for 11.25 to come along, I would practice reading the Dow Jones Industrial Average and price of gold, price of crude oil. I would practice reading them in the voice of Gordon Williams. I actually wrote down the formatics of the uh, Gordon Williams business report, the formatics being, you know, he had a certain formula he would follow. He had a certain script. And so I would write a business report in the style of Gordon Williams and then actually do his voice. And on top of that, just to make sure it sounded like a real report, I had a bunch of network radio commercials that we used to run for compensation at the radio station that, you know, instead of the usual ads for cow manure and the other things we were selling on the air, guns, um, I would have a commercial like Apple, back in the early days of Apple Computer. And I remember there were Dick Cavett was doing commercials for Apple Computer, and I used to have a commercial that I knew might play in the Gordon Williams business report. So I would do the report as Gordon Williams. Stock prices are up. Gold is down. I'm Gordon Williams. I would do the report like that. And the guy never caught on. Al Charles, general manager, I know if somebody knows Al out there, you can tell him I said it. He never knew that for months I was Gordon Williams. I didn't fudge the reports. The reports were accurate. <laughs> but I pretended to be Gordon Williams because I couldn't remember to record the Gordon Williams business report. And that's what it was like working in small market radio, just a little taste of it and... 
here I was working at this station. I was 24, 25 years old. I had never lived away from home, like away from New York before, and I'm living in Stanton, Virginia. And on Thanksgiving Day, which was about six or seven weeks after I arrived in Stanton, there were a number of other people who worked at the station. And by the way, nobody was from Stanton, Virginia. Nobody. And the reason was simple. They couldn't find anybody who could put two words together who lived in Stanton, Virginia. So they, they had to import us. From, it's like hockey teams. You know, you're know, you not going to find any hockey players in Tampa Bay, Florida. So the Tampa Bay Lightning team is made up of Russians and, and Canadians. You have to bring people in from other places because nobody there knows how to play hockey. Hell, there's no ice. Well, the same thing at a radio station. If you have a, a city where... Half the people are unemployed, underemployed, or just plain illiterate. Now, you have to go out and find people in places where they have, like, reading and writing in school, you know, people where people could read English and, and could show up at work sober every day. And I, I qualified on at least one of those counts, and so I was hired. So everybody there, there was one guy, the midday guy, who was from Schenectady, New York, and another guy was from Rockford, Illinois. Somebody else was from Atlanta. Nobody was from Stanton, Virginia. So nobody was near home. So on Thanksgiving, I invited all the guys from the radio station to come to my house for Thanksgiving dinner because we all had to work on that day. That day and the day after, there was no going home for Thanksgiving. And by the way, no days off. There was no best of Tom Likas. Are you kidding me? Uh, the, there might be loose cattle out there. You'd have to be at the station to report and, and, and where to drive slowly so you don't hit any cows. I'm not making that up. That actually happened. On Thanksgiving Day, I made Thanksgiving dinner at my... I had a room in a boarding house, which had previously been occupied. I'm not making this up. It had previously been occupied by retards, literally. There were like three of them living as roommates, and the kitchen floor looked like retards had been living there. I spent most of my time with a chisel and some Brillo pads trying to clean the linoleum in the kitchen. Most of the time I lived in Santa Virginia, yeah, that place never felt completely clean to me, never. But it was $190 a month, so I lived there. By the way, $190 a month was like 30% of my entire month's salary. So, the guys all came over. And the thing is, all of them were never there at any one time because one would have to leave to spell the other one at the radio station. So, like, one guy would go, okay, i got to go to work. There'd be an empty chair. And then 10 minutes later, the chair would be filled by the guy who just got off the air. He would sit down in the chair, and we would continue with the meal. Then another guy would get up and say, okay, now I have to go to work. He would get up and go over to the radio station, and then pretty soon the guy who had left originally, he comes back and sits in that chair. And finally, I did the 5.30 to midnight shift, so the guys cleaned up while I went over to the radio station, and, and I did my shift. Fortunately, there was no business report on Thanksgiving, so I didn't have to be Gordon Williams that day. The bottom line here is that all these guys live far from home. None of them live nearby. None of them live near their parents. And they could not go home. And so that began my tradition of orphan Thanksgiving. It started with radio guys, and then it expanded to include other people I knew who lived far away from their families or they didn't get along with their families for whatever reason. And now every year, somewhere between 15 and 25 people show up at my home on Thanksgiving Day. Some of them are doing radio shows on that day. Some of them are working in the morning and then coming in the afternoon. Some of them don't work on Thanksgiving, but some of them are home uh, for the weekend because they have to work on Friday or Saturday or Sunday, so they can't go back to where their families are, which is frequently in other states or other countries or whatever. And in that case, what are you going home for Thanksgiving weekend anyway if your parents don't live in a country where they celebrate Thanksgiving? But I digress. The point is that uh, I enjoy my day because a traditional Thanksgiving dinner that I cook from scratch for the people I know and many people who have been very close to me for very many years. 
and some who are new people I've found who are in the same predicament. They can't go home for Thanksgiving or they have no place to go. And it's the most fulfilling, fun day of my year. It's the best. But I know I'm listening to people out there right now. As the phone rings, I'm going to be listening to an awful lot of you, I'm sure. I know there are people listening to me right now who can't go home for Thanksgiving or won't go home for Thanksgiving. Now, maybe you need to start your own orphan Thanksgiving and invite other people you know in the same predicament because rather than having a turkey sandwich from the local uh, deli or the 7-Eleven and watching It's a Wonderful Life, perhaps you ought to be doing this. All right? But all right, you have it. You can't go home. You're going to be alone on Thanksgiving. You sad sack you. And there are reasons why you can't or won't go home for Thanksgiving. So this can be a very melancholy hour, and we do it every year. Uh, but I know there are people out there who listen to the radio for companionship, but I know there are people out there right now who tomorrow will not be going anywhere. Maybe your parents and you don't get along. Maybe uh, you have a girlfriend that the, the family doesn't approve of or a wife the family doesn't approve of or who knows, maybe you're gay or lesbian and the family just said, don't call us anymore, don't come over anymore, or you did something that, to piss off the family. Or maybe uh, your family uh, isn't around anymore. Maybe everybody died. I mean, they all died in a plane crash and you're the only survivor. I don't know. There could be any number of reasons. I would like to talk to you. If you can't go home or you won't go home for Thanksgiving, call me right now and tell us why. Tom Likas. 1 800 5800 Tom. 1 800 5800 I just have a problem with you calling women dumb bitches. I don't see where you get off. Well, I only do it when they are dumb bitches. Yeah, but it's just such a derogatory term. You cannot find any other words in your vocabulary just to express how you feel. Oh, yeah. Dumb whores, uh, stupid broads. There's plenty of words about it. Okay? You're not even yeah, I, I'm a, Why are you on I'm, the radio? This is I'm over the hill slots. I mean, I'm, I'm like a thesaurus. I got plenty of words. It's the Dumb Like It Show. <laughs> Talking to people who can't go home for Thanksgiving or won't go home for Thanksgiving. If that's you, call me now at 1 800 5800 Tom. Tyler on the Tom Likas show. Hello. Tom, how you doing? I'm doing okay. Hey, uh, great topic. Uh, I try to avoid all family during this time of year, even uh, try to schedule like vacations during like. Christmas and whatnot, uh, definitely not going to hang out with the parents and get the same questions year after year. How you, how's things going? How's work? How's, who are you dating? You know, I mean, I, I'd rather just give them a resume and, you know, update it every few months and, uh, you know, pass it out. It's the same questions over and over. Because they don't really know you anymore and they don't know what to say to you when you show up. There's no, yeah, there's no common, so I try to avoid the whole thing, you know. I just, I'm, I just rather, I used to have jobs when I was a kid, you know, growing up, like I, I had a job at a hotel where we were open on Thanksgiving and stuff like that, and it was great because I could always use that as an excuse, but now that, like, I have a nine-to-five, I can't use it as an excuse, so I have to come up with other things, you know. So what do you do on Thanksgiving? Oh, uh, well, um, hang out with a couple other buddies who have come up with the same same idea. Usually we get a little card game going, uh, take a few uh, bong rips there, Tom, and, uh, you know, just hang out and relax, have a good time. love having the days off work. Don't get me wrong, but uh, just, uh, just kicking it with the boys, uh, a little card game. Do you eat anything like turkey? Oh, yeah, yeah. What's great is uh, I always stop by, you know, the parents' house maybe uh, – a day or two later and, and, and really stock up on some leftovers. So I can oh, but not on out. Thanksgiving. You don't have any, you, know, like you don't stop by Ralph's and pick up, uh, you know, a turkey breast or something. No. No, no. Del Taco drive through or, you know, something. Del place. Taco on Thanksgiving. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know how we do it, Tom. And you don't even go in. It's the drive through because you know what? 
can you imagine looking around at the other people who are at Del Taco on Thanksgiving? No knock at Del Taco. Del Taco's fantastic. It's the people who have to be in there on Thanksgiving. I worked all, oh, yeah. Well, they they just love getting the hours, if you know what I mean. Right. You know? Oh, I understand. I'm not talking about the workers. I'm talking about the customers. Oh, all the other uh, uh, dysfunctional people that aren't seeing their families. Yes, all yeah. the other sad sacks out there. That You know the ones I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm part of the group. Tom, hey, uh, you take vacations during Christmas to avoid family as well, don't you? Oh, I take vac my, my family lives on the other side of the country. I take vacations uh, during Christmas to uh, avoid 50-degree uh, weather. <laughs> okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, not a big uh, big hanging out with the family, doing the same thing uh, time after time. Not, you know, hey, it's turkey. I can have it any day of the week. What's, you know, what's this big deal? And people overstuffing themselves for, for what? You know, I mean, uh, it's just I'm not a very traditional guy, not a big uh, religious guy. So well, I'm I don't not know. a religious it's, guy. <laughs> yeah. I just, it's a day celebrating gluttony, of course. Oh, yeah, that's great, isn't it? Well, it, that's, why, that's why I do it. That's why I have turkey. Hang on oh, a second. You, so, Hang on so a second. You, Kirk, Kirk, what did you want to say to Tyler? Yeah, hey, Tom. Man, uh, my phone. Oh, watch your mouth, we're on the air. We can't use that word in that context. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm listening to this individual on your radio, and, uh, you know, my parents are dead, my friend. And, and to hear people talk down about their mom and their dad really makes me upset. Uh, you know, one day they're not going to be there, and then what? So, I, hey, I uh, think, you know what? Just go to your grandma's, your aunt's, have a good time, do the same rigmarole, have fun, and uh, I'll do my own thing there, bud. Hey, man, you know, go ahead, bro. Man, I'm just saying, you know, there's, there's, there's two sides to every story. And, and FYI, bro. Grandma's dead, you know. I have no relatives. It's me and, and Southern California, and I hey, love it. Uh, you want to play? Yeah, you, know, you want to play cards? Think tomorrow. about what you're saying. All right. You want to you play some cards tomorrow, bud? Hey, Tom. <laughs> I guess that's a no on I that time. No, yeah. <laughs> I can't. We, we were breaking up. I got a bad cell phone. Hey, man. Happy Thanksgiving, Tom. You take care of yourself, brother. And the same to you. Kirk, Tyler, thank you for the calls. Tom Likas. 1-800-5800-TOM. 1-800-5800-866. My parents didn't talk to me about sex. I learned by doing. Exactly. I learned, I learned by doing half the class. That's how I learned. <laughs> it's the Tom Likas Show. Tom like this show Thanksgiving tomorrow. And we're talking to people who cannot or will not go home for Thanksgiving dinner. Jason on the Tom Like His Show. Hello. Hey, long time, second time. Thank you, Jason. Hey, I cannot go home for Thanksgiving because I DTB'd my wife of 12 years and got myself a 24 year old. Smoking little hottie. Hey, come over here for dinner. What are you kidding me? I, my mom invites us to Thanksgiving, you know, and so she calls and tells me she invited my wife and kids too. And I said, "Well, if you're going to invite them, don't invite me." I said, "I'm not going." She called back, left the phone number for Domino's Pizza for me, and uh, so I turned around. And I called my little hottie, and I'm like, "Hey, what do you think about going to Vegas? I want to go to the Palms for Thanksgiving." <laughs> He said, he goes, that sounds great. He goes, want me to bring one of my girlfriends with me? I said, baby, why would you do that? I go, we never bring sand to the beach. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> so, you know what? You can have the wife and kids over there, Mom. I'm going to Vegas. <laughs> okay? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, when you, when they finally brought me back on the air here, I'm back in my new Corvette into the garage. And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> I'm doing this because I can. <laughs> that ball and chain held me down. I tell you what, the seven thousand dollars a month in alimony and child support worth is it? worth every penny. <laughs> they 
tell you divorces are so expensive. It's because they're worth it. That's exactly right. I've been listening to you, and I get more ass than a toilet seat like you wouldn't believe. So you, you left that bitch because you're a listener. I'm a listener, and I just listening to you every day, and I'm like, wait a sec. I'm not getting my basic needs met here. I foot the bill for everything. I'm the one that's bringing home $250,000 a year, and she's just living like a, you know, a princess that isn't giving up the pistachios. You know what I mean? I understand. And so, you know, you can't walk me by the buffet too many times without feeding me. <laughs> and I tell you what, I got a whole new life ahead of me. I am, uh, I am so proud of you, buffet. Jason. I can't tell you. I'm going to look back on this when I'm 70 and just smile on my face. Yeah, that's the best Love thing I ever it. did. Very nice. I guarantee you in the last two years, I've gotten more tail than I did in 12 years of marriage. Probably two or three times. Seth. How great is that? The wife even asked me, how many times did you and your girlfriend do it? And I looked at her, and I go, about 500. <laughs> and she goes, no, really, how many? I go, well, you know, maybe 10 or something. So then I turn around and I ask the girlfriend, I go, hey, in the last nine months, how many times do you think we've done it? And she starts counting on her fingers, you know, smart blonde. She's like, I don't know, maybe 700 times. <laughs> I'm like, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you money to go shopping. You can do whatever the hell you want. Just, how great is that? You know, and then brings home the straggler girlfriend every now and then. I mean, life is good. Wow. Well, I'll tell Life you what, good. we are we are proud of you, Jason. How great is that? 1-800-5800-TOM is our telephone number. These are people who cannot or will not go home for Thanksgiving. Here comes Michael on the Tom Likas show. Hello. Hello, Tom. Hello, Michael. Hey, um, well, I can't go home because I married my first cousin. <laughs> Both of our families don't like that, um, so we can't go. So we have a kid. We can take him to Disneyland. It's open for Thanksgiving. Oh, my goodness. How did this happen? Oh, now you have to tell me the story. Well, um, well, I'm 30 years old now. We've been married for seven years. I have a three-year-old kid. Oh, banger. <laughs> <laughs> You know, now, that, now, Michael, when did you I, I when did you no first take my game? I tell you that, dude. What? Yeah, dude, Tom, I'm telling you, we just had a kid, three year old. If you see other girls that have kids, some of them blow up like a the Goodyear blimp. Not like, this one, now, Tom. We had a kid. Yeah, no stretch marks, Tom. She takes care of herself and takes care of her man. Now, Michael, how old were you when you first noticed your cousin? Well. Well, dude, when we were young, she was, you know, she was pretty young and, you know, she was already, a, uh, you know, she was ready to blossom like any other girl, but she, she damn, Tom, she, the first thing I know when I was a little kid, she, she, I see little boobs. And she was, I was like 14, 15. I'm like, oh, right. You know, the first game we played, you know, we're over there at their house spending the night. I'm all like, oh, hey, you know, I touched them and I fell in love with them. You when know, you were 15? Yep. That's the first time we ever messed around. Look at that. Yep. After that, Tom, that was the best. And the family is upset about this. Yes, they are. She's the daughter of who? Oh, my dad's sister. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And, you know, but... Hey, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, Subway's. I just have to pre-order it and pick it up on today. <laughs> <laughs> and your kid, your kid's not in special ed or anything, is he? No, nah, Tom. No. I have to Mark, ask. He's, he's, no, he's not like no Scarface guy or or uh, what that Texas Chainsaw Massacre guy or any you of that. You never know when you come up with a tart after that. You know that. Uh, that can happen for God's sake. Happy Thanksgiving. The Tom Likas Show.